<laughs> okay, Sarah Palugi and Sarah Bradley, um, both from iSIMS, who are here to discuss some really important tips that every one of you can use in this new world of virtual recruiting and virtual applying and virtual interviewing, knowing that the first step is if your resume doesn't get through the filters, nothing else matters. So we want to talk about how important it is to understand the applicant tracking systems and who better to hear that from than people who work for an ATS. So with all that, I'll leave it to you. Thank you so much, both of you in advance and uh, I'm muted. Well, hey guys, so I will start the traditional Zoom conversation with sharing my screen. Um, and then Sarah and I are gonna introduce ourselves. So let me get that going. Alrighty. So quick agenda for today. Um, we're going to cover off on really kind of two key areas. So first and foremost, who we are. Um, so about iSIMS, the company. Um, and then we'll talk more about iSIMS, the product. And that will make more sense to you in a minute. Um, and then how our products are used in the campus recruiting space. And then really the goal of this conversation is to answer any of the questions that you have. So um, my colleague, Sarah, is gonna be monitoring the chat. So Sarah, if you see any questions pop up there, I'm gonna just stop me. I'm happy to kind of answer them live, but we'll also have time at the end for Q and A. Um, that way, any questions that you guys have can be answered. Because that's really our goal here is to help you walk away feeling more confident about who we are and just more confident using applicant tracking software in general. Um, so we'll just start by introducing ourselves first. Um, it's the Sarah and Sarah early career team, so we're super easy to remember. Um, I'm Sarah Palugi. I am one of our early career recruiters here, so I do focus more on full-time hiring at this point um, and program management. Um, I was a graduate of Monmouth University, so I've lived in New Jersey my entire life. Um, except for a quick semester abroad in Florence, but um, New Jersey the whole time. Um, right out of school, I joined a company called Compass Group. Um, you probably haven't heard of them, but you probably, um, you know, have been around them more than you think. They run uh, like a number of different things, but like airport, um, like lounges, and they do a lot of uh, campus catering halls and things like that. So you'd be kind of surprised how often you run into a Compass Group, but I worked for their event planning leg, which was called Flick. Um, and so I did corporate event planning right out of college. Um, from there, I transitioned into the campus recruitment and program management team for cities, um, enterprise operations and technology teams. And I ran some of their leadership development programs and it was a really fun time working in lower Manhattan. Um, I decided that my commute of two plus hours was just getting a little too long. A city moved out to Queens um, and I moved down to Monmouth County. So I um, was super excited to find iSIMS. They were looking for a campus recruiter uh, to be their first campus recruiter to really help build out what early career recruiting looked like at iSIMS. And I thought, uh, besides the fact that it was a 15 minute commute, like what a cool opportunity. So um, I joined iSIMS in 2015 and um, I've been there ever since. There. Awesome. Um, hi, everybody. Sarah Bradley. I know I look a little different than my picture. <laughs> Just a tad different. Um, I went to Rutgers, graduated in May of 2014, and then I was fortunate enough to start at iSIMS pretty much immediately after, um, which was a blessing because I know there were a lot of people I worked with who were struggling to find full-time jobs at that time. So was very grateful for that. I started as a temp actually um, in HR and um, was transitioned into full time not too long afterwards and have been there ever since. Um, I really started in the you know talent benefits, talent management space, and then recently was fortunate enough to um, transition over to talent acquisition um, as a university recruiter alongside Sarah. So that has been so fun, really amazing. Um, I really enjoy connecting with students and, and building relationships with different schools and engaging. Um, so this is a great opportunity and, and we're definitely really excited to be here. I always joke that we have like, the two of us are like the perfect example of what happens after college. Sarah went to school for HR, graduated and got a job in HR, <laughs> still in HR. Um, and I, you know, went to school for public relations, graduated, didn't know what to do, took an event planning job, liked it, but not enough, popped over to campus recruiting, left there, went somewhere else. So, you know, there's so many different paths that you can take as you're looking to figure out your plan. Um, but that's not why we're here. We're not here to talk about us. We're really here to, um, like I said, first kind of ramp you guys up to iSIMS, the company, 
um, who we are and what we do, and then we'll talk more about our products. So um, I'm not going to ask anyone to do a show of hands. I'm going to assume that you all have heard of iSIMS and you know exactly who we are and what we do. So this will just be a refresher. Um, we are the leading recruitment software provider for employers to attract, engage, and hire great people. If that doesn't make sense to you right now, that's totally fine. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about our products and what they do and how they, you know, how you've interacted with them and how you've engaged. But the key things for you to keep in mind, um, we've been in business for 20 years. Um, our headquarters is in Homedale, New Jersey, which is awesome. Um, as I mentioned, I, it was part of the reason I decided to join because it was really cool to have a, a short commute. Um, we'll get into a little bit more about location because we are growing um, both in size and in location. Um, oh, so let people in. We've got a lot of people coming in now. Um, we have over 4,500 contracted customers. So that is pretty cool, which means um, you probably use our software more than you know. And like I said, we'll get into more about who our customers are and how you've used our product down the line. Um, and right now we're over 1,000 employees. Uh, I talked a little bit about our headquarters um, and our growth and what that looks like for us. Um, we are growing not only in size um, and scope, but in location as well. So we've always been headquartered um, in New Jersey. We started in Matawan, um, and, or actually we started in Hazlitt, New Jersey, moved to Matawan, and then Homedale. Um, and then we decided that we wanted to grow outside of just the New Jersey area because there's great talent all over. Um, right now we have a small office in New York from a company that we acquired. Um, our biggest kind of push recently has been to expand our Denver, Colorado um, office, which is super new and really cool. We get to, um, you know, engage with a whole new set of schools and students and talent out there as we kind of focus on growing out. Um, we've been calling our Mountain Time office. Um, and then we do have a sales um, front, which is growing quite a bit um, as well, our UK operation. So that's been something that's been really fun to staff as well. Um, and we're also part of Vista Equity Partners. So um, a little bit, you know, different than, you know, kind of a, a traditional private equity versus public company, but we were privately owned and privately funded um, for about 19 of the 20 years. And then about a year, year and a half ago, Vista came in and really kind of put an investment into iSIMS and said, if you guys are going to grow, um, we want it and, you know, you need our capital. We want to be there to help you do it. So um, being part of the Vista portfolio, they actually have all software companies um, within their reach. I don't know if anyone has heard of Vista, but um, a number, I think it's like 65 different software companies underneath Vista's leg. So that really does make us part of the fourth largest software company worldwide. So that's pretty cool. Um, and just here are some of our customers. So uh, some of these you guys might have heard of, like Sherm. Some might be new to you, like Amazon. I'm sure no one's heard of Amazon before. But um, these are just some of the customers that utilize our product. Uh, so if you've ever applied to a job at Amazon, you've used our software to complete that application. And if you could think about all of the hundreds of thousands of you know, jobs and applicants and candidates and data that an Amazon might have, we have access to all of that data as a product as well. So um, it's really, really cool to be able to see like what Amazon does with our software versus what Subway does with our software versus what, you know, a small marketing firm in the Midwest might do with our software. So um, it's highly configurable and a number of different companies can utilize it and they do. Remember, we have over 4,500 contracted customers. So um, we're in more places than you think. Um, we have a strong focus on hiring and maintaining an award-winning culture. So we are so focused on hiring the right person through the process because it really helps us to drive those results. Um, and we're really proud of our company culture and really proud of our accomplishments. Um, this is what we like to call our brag slide. Um, it's all the awards that we've won throughout the years. Best places to work. Our best award is for our training and development team who is truly top notch. We won women in tech awards, fastest growing software company awards. My personal favorite, um, our internship program got top 100 internship programs in 2019, which was really cool. Um, our former CEO, Colin, has won a number of top CEO awards. Um, you know, we just, we're so proud of everything that the company's done over the last 20 years. And both Sarah and I started when we were about 250, 300 employees and like two like floor office and, you know, wherever, Matawan at the time. And now we're all over the globe and it's just really cool to kind of see the company grow and, and still be able to maintain that culture. Um, we are obsessed with customer service and customer experience. And when I say obsessed, I truly mean obsessed. We have a very large customer support team. They win a ton of awards. People send them like cookies and cakes and thank you cards and celebrating their year long anniversary of having iSIMS and like 
honestly, I can't think of a software that I have or anything that I have that I like celebrate having it for a year. People literally celebrate having iSense the product. So um, it's just really cool to, you know, kind of have that fan base and just, you know, we don't get there overnight. You get there by literally being obsessed over customer service and customer experience. So if any of you guys are interested in pursuing a role in customer service or never thought that you could have a career in customer service, um, come talk to us because there's so many roles and so many opportunities to grow a really successful career at iSims in that customer facing space. And really, like I said, at the end of the day, it's all about outcome, it's all about results. So here are some other um, customers that use our product. Hard Rock Cafe, I'm sure you guys have seen, Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Um, so if you've ever applied to jobs at any of these companies, again, you're using our product to do it. And here are some of the things that our product has helped them, you know, decrease cost per hire, um, double candidate response rate, uh, a reduction in onboarding time. Like these are some of the things that applicant tracking softwares help um, our customers accomplish. So, you know, when we kind of go through our product and what it is and how you use it, um, it'll be helpful for you guys to know like why recruiters, you know, use this type of software and why it's important. Um, I walked through a lot for you guys. So, you know, really we could boil it down to kind of one key thing. What do we do, right? We help um, employers find job seekers. So people like Sarah and I, our product helps us find you guys. And then obviously on the other side of the house, um, it helps you guys find us better. It helps job seekers find jobs. Um, does that make sense so far? Are you guys all with me? Do we have any, do we have any questions in the chat? Do we have any questions live? Any brave souls willing to unmute themselves and ask me a question? Okay. Well, if time, I have a whole Q and A slide where I'm going to make you talk. <laughs> all right. So campus recruitment and the iSIMS products. Like, why are we here today? Why are we doing this presentation? This is obviously not your run of the mill info session. We wanted to obviously give you the background and help you understand iSIMS, who we are, what we do as a company, what's important to us. But we're here to talk to you about applicant tracking software, which is essentially what we do. We build applicant tracking software. So when you go to an event and you meet with iSIMS or any one of our other 4,500 customers, they might hand you an iPad or they might send you a link and say, hey, do me a favor, sign up in here for me. We want your contact information. Um, you know, we want to be able to stay in touch with you as you move through your college career or as you graduate. Um, that page might look like this. Or they might say, hey, thanks so much for your interest. Like, we'd love for you to go to our career site and apply for a job. They might send you to a page that looks like that. Now, you might be thinking, why am I doing this? Like, we talked. I feel like I'm a good fit. I feel like you liked me. Like, What's going on? Why do I have to click apply? Why is that important? It's important for a number of reasons. Um, one, for compliance. Two, to keep everything organized and in one place. Um, and three, because it's really going to enhance your candidate experience. When we talk about that black hole after you click apply, our goal is going to be to help demystify the black hole during the end of this presentation. So you guys all know what happens after you click that button. What happens next? So what are our four products? Um, we have a number of products and growing. I feel like this presentation could already be out of date based on what our software engineering teams already have being built and in the mix. But as of right now, we have these kind of core components. So we have products that allow you to essentially, um, you know, be engaged at every step of the recruitment process. So when we're on campus and we have an event and we say like, hey, can you sign into our iPads? Or like sign up here to show me that you attended that event. Those are some of our products in um, our recruitment marketing suite. So our nurture and our attract products. Um, they allow us to be able to literally go out and attract candidates like yourself to come back and apply for our jobs. And again, when I talk about this, this is for iSIMS, for us, the company, but also all of our other customers, like Amazon has the same product umbrella, right? They're still using all of our products to kind of get their recruiting done too. Um, our hiring suite to recruit, when you click apply, you go into recruit, that's our recruit product offer. We're excited to make you an offer and have you join our internship program or, you know, join a full-time role after you graduate. Um, we have an offer product that manages that whole process. It pulls the contract together, has you e-sign it. Uh, we have a pre-boarding product as well that uh, gets you ready to go for your first day, gets you a desk when desks become a thing again, gets you a phone, an email, password, um, you know, your I-9 documentation, um, you know, figures out, you know, any type of background screen that needs to be done. That all happens in our pre-boarding tool. Um, and then we have little chat bots that like help make the recruiter's job a little easier. We have 
um, our text recruit product, which allows recruiters to text candidates. So if Sarah or I meet you on campus and we think you're a great fit, we can send you a text through that product and you could schedule a call with us automated right in that email chat or that text chat. Um, and then we have Ari, who's our chat bot. If you go to our career site, just like any other product, um, if you just had a quick question like, hey, like where's your headquarters? Or you could say Homedale, New Jersey. So you don't even have to wait to talk to a recruiter before you can get some of those questions answered. Um, sound good so far? Do I have any questions on these? Cool. So here's the moment you've all been waiting for. Behind the curtain, in the middle of the black hole, we have our applicant tracking software. So this is what a job looks like for us in our applicant tracking software. So when we post a job, this is director of technical sales, but let's for the sake of this audience say, you know, we have a software engineering internship open, right? This is exactly what Sarah and I look at every single day. This is the job in the rack. So you see the bucket up there. It says new candidates, external candidates, and it kind of funnels down uh, internal applicants, agency submittals, recruiter reviews. That status is what we call the funnel or the you know, recruiting pipeline. So when you're newly applying to a job, you'll go in that external applicant bin. We drop that bin down and we see your name. We click on your name, we review your application, and we decide if you look like a good fit. If you are, we move you to the next step in the process. And we kind of go through, go through, go through, go through until we get to the offer stage. When you accept the offer, you move into another product and we kind of take it from there. But this at least gives you an idea of what Sarah and I see every single day. We are obsessed with our reps. We're in it constantly, 24 seven, looking for new applicants like yourself. So did you guys have any idea that this is what it looked like on the back end? When you hit apply and you hit submit on your resume, did you have any idea this is what it looked like? If anyone says yes, I'm gonna think you're lying. <laughs> it is definitely something that, you know, we feel candidates and, you know, students like yourself haven't been exposed to enough because you hit submit and you feel like, did it just go into a giant database? Like, did it go nowhere? How do I know if the recruiter is gonna see it? What if it's not attached to the right job? I assure you it's on the right job. It's very apparent to us that we're there um, and we're excited. You know, we get excited when we see candidates come through as well. So this is what you look like to us in an applicant tracking software. Um, you know, the whole myth about recruiters only being able to look at your resume for five seconds before they decide if you're a fit or not, it's true. Because on any given day, we can have 50 candidates in that bucket and we're deciding very quickly who we wanna move forward with. We look for a, key, a few key things. So um, fit for the role, educational requirements, location, those are all things that recruiters' eyes are gonna go to right away. If we're looking for a software engineer, we require a computer science degree, um, you know, and you live in Michigan, but the internship's in New Jersey and you're not willing to locate, um, you know, those are some things that we're going to make decisions on very quickly. We'll look for internship experience or project experience or volunteer experience um, and use those five seconds really fast to make that decision of do we think we're moving forward with you or not. But this is what you look like, right, for, at least in the iSense product. It, it wouldn't have a picture of you unless you uploaded it, but that's besides the point. But it'll have your name, it'll have your last job, it'll have um, sources job fair. Um, so when we say like, oh, sign into this, um, you know, iPad for us, or, you know, register here so we know that we met you today. I can be like, oh, Amy Andrews, I met her at the job. I remember her, like she was great. Okay, yeah, definitely moving forward. So it shows source of how you came into the product, shows your entire resume and all of your history. And then all those tabs at the top, are other ways for us to track information on you. Screen movie, did you interview with us before? What's your experience? Um, employee tab is after you've been hired, but you know, being able to schedule you for interviews, for other jobs that you've applied to. So all of your candidate data is in one clean, concise, organized place, and we have that whole profile that we can be making that decision on. Sound good? Any questions on this piece? Did you guys know that that's what you look like in an applicant tracking software? You all look like Amy. Andrews. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, is there any sort of scoring going on behind the scenes or is a person reading every resume that's coming in? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe for when you guys are hiring or for any of your clients? Sure. Yeah. So the cool thing about the iSIM software is that it's highly configurable. Um, and configurable means that we allow our customers to set it up for whatever way makes the most sense for them. Um, we don't, I think the biggest myth of applicant tracking software in this end of iSIMS is that we're automatically like pulling people or like pushing people out of the process. 
That's true to an extent. So there are screening questions that you would set up, um, you know, prior to so that um, over here where it says screen is how you answered the screening questions. Um, so like up where it says Amy Andrews and says resume and the next tab is screen. Those are preset questions that a recruiter will set for the rec. So let's say for a software engineering internship, you have to be a current student. You have to be willing to work in hometown New Jersey and you have to have a strong understanding of Java. If I say that those are three requirements and if you say no to any of those, you will automatically get declined. You will automatically get declined. Those are our non-negotiables. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, if someone passes those and they come in, that they're going to be like pushed out for other reasons. The only way someone can be automatically declined um, is if they answer the, the screening questions in a non-favorable way. Um, and companies and recruiters can set that up however they want to. So a company like um, Amazon might get 70,000 applications the second they open up a software engineering internship job. So their screening questions will be much tighter, right? They might have a, uh, a higher screen out rate because it's hard for them to get through all of the applicants where we're a much smaller company and while well, I'm sure at some point we'll get 70,000 applications the second we open a job, that's just not the case right now. So we don't have to screen out as many candidates and we can go through, Sarah and I can go through and, and eyeball them a little bit better. Um, but that being said, it is configurable. So however the customer wants to set it up, they can. Now from an AI and machine learning perspective, we are working on updates to the product that will recommend better matches, but it will not screen people out, it will not decline people, it will not automatically move people through the process. So it'll just say like, hey, you know, your six requirements that you set up, um, it looks like this person's actually a really good match. And that's meant to be helpful to recruiters because it helps us kind of see the best matches first. And it could be someone that we never thought to look at, right? With those five second times, you do sometimes human error miss a really good candidate because their title wasn't what you were looking for. Their degree wasn't what you were looking for, but they have those key words in their customer commitment, you know, Java, um, you know, software as a service, and you just didn't see it. So it'll help kind of pull that right person up. Um, but we, you know, people always say like, oh, do you think the robots are going to take over your job in recruiting? And eventually you'll be obsolete because the AI is going to be so strong. You really, you can't screen out like that human element to it. So I think there will always be that, that person kind of reviewing piece to this. Sarah, I have a question. Since uh, many colleges, including us, um, we just adopted Handshake. Yeah. And so students are going into Handshake and employers are searching for our students on Handshake. Mm -hmm. And many times they pull their information from whatever data the student has put into Handshake, whether they've made their profile public or not, the major that they have stated, you know, their degree major. Right. I'm curious what you've seen as the schisms because we have so many questions as to if the degree happens to say, you know, business slash data analytics, and that's not one of the majors in the appropriate mm -hmm. box, whether then they get tossed out or what kind of advice can you give our students when they are using Handshake to apply um, as much as you know about how employers grab the data and contact them directly because we're out of the process then. So I'm curious what your observations have been. Yeah, I always say make yourself as searchable as possible. Um, that's the same for anything, for a resume or for LinkedIn. I know that when I first started recruiting, and I had never heard this before, but people would ask me like, oh, like, so should we like put like keywords at the bottom of our resume in like white? So like you can't see it, like it pulls. I'm like, no, that's doing too much. Like you don't have to go that far just make your resume as searchable as possible. Um, as much as you can customize something, customize it. Um, but if you're just uploading like a generic resume, put as much of your experience on there as you can so you are searchable. Now, that being said, of course, people are gonna get missed. So if there's a job that you really wanna to apply to um, and you wanna make sure a recruiter is gonna consider you, um, I always use the example of like when I applied to iSIMS, technically my title at City was Graduate Recruitment and Program Management and the job posting at iSIMS was um, university relations specialist. It's very much the same set of responsibilities, but completely different titles. And if they were searching for university relations specialist to fill the job at iSIMS, they weren't going to catch my profile because my title didn't have the word relations or university in it at all. 
So I uh, kind of tweaked my resume a little bit to make sure I included those keywords and edited my title a bit to make sure that I, you know, was searchable. And, you know, if they were looking at the rec, I wasn't even going to take a chance that the recruiter was going to say, oh, I'm looking for a university relations specialist. She was just a graduate recruiter. <laughs> like, you know, I knew that it was the same thing, but if the person reviewing my resume didn't know that, there's a chance they could have passed on me. So I always say as much as you can customize it, customize it, um, but make it as searchable as possible. Put certifications, classes, projects, and things like that on there. Um, but, you know, you do have to kind of like apply, do the work, you know, get it in front of the right recruiter in the right role. Um, Thank there's you. There's a question in the chat, and I think you just answered it. Actually, it's from Jamie. Um, does keywords on the resume matter? I think <laughs> the answer is, yeah, you can speak it. In a way. <laughs> and, yeah, in a way. Are applicants filtered out in any way? Yeah, so it depends on how, you know, like I said, every company is going to set this up differently. So for ISMs, we usually don't filter too many people out off the jump. There are some set requirements for the role. And requirement means we do not have any flexibility to bring you in if you don't meet this qualification. Um, and that's where we screen people out. So like I said, if you have to be able to commute or work in home doll as a requirement of the job and you say that you can't do that, you do not meet the minimum qualifications for the job. Now, there are other nice to haves like, um, you know, a requirement might be you need to have a good understanding of Java. A nice to have might be um, you've worked at another software company before, right? We would not screen you out for a nice to have. We would only screen you out for a need to have. Um, and keywords, yeah, I mean, they definitely help. Um, recruiters kind of see and search and find you, but you don't have to get like so obsessive about it. Uh, I know sometimes people are like, should I list everything I've ever learned ever in my life on my resume just in case? No, because the second part of that is we're going to talk to you about that experience. And if you can't give us, you know, tangible ex examples of what you know about it, we're not really going to count it, right? If you say like, oh, I, I'm an expert in Tableau, which is a data visualization software. Um, if you've only ever heard of Tableau, eventually that's going to come out. So, you know, just be honest and truthful about your experience, but, um, you know, try to be the best representation of yourself on your resume. A couple more questions from Jamie. She asked, what type of formatting is recommended? Are resume templates okay? And what's the best way to use keywords? Yeah, so formatting um, becomes important, especially with applicant tracking software. So it's a great question because um, we have a parsing tool that will take your, your data and kind of like pull it and put it into the area it should be in. So um, tail is old this time when people apply to jobs. Like the common like UGG moment is, why do you need me to retype my experience when it's on my resume? Like, can't it just pull it from my resume and put it in that box for you? Do I really need to go through this again? Um, the answer is the ISM product does pull it from your resume and put it in the box for you so you don't have to do it again. That being said, there's like all this complex like AI, like techie stuff on the back end that tells like where on a resume someone's experience should be. Like, don't even get me started on how these people figure this out. But we have a parsing tool that will say like, oh, the, the name is typically here and they'll pull your name. I love to see it with my creative people. So my like graphic designers and stuff, it's great to see the really cool resumes, like where your name's like up the side or it's like you've made it into like a sailboat or something. And like, that's great. Like, but for most people, 99% of the world, a regular standard formatted resume is like perfectly acceptable. Again, we are only looking at resumes for about five seconds, five to eight seconds. So if I have to like, like go back and move in and like look and try to find your name and your experience because it's in a box over there, like just keep it as simple as possible for recruiters. Um, and the best way to utilize keywords is just like I said, matching. So if you really want to be um, a data analyst at a company and you know, you read their job description and they're asking for X, Y, and Z experience, and you know you have that, try to use their exact words so that if they're looking for, you know, pieces of that job description, again, a recruiter could be, uh, Sarah, how many different jobs do you have this summer? Like 30 different jobs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, at any given moment, you could be recruiting for 30 different types of people. So recruiters don't always have the time or the capacity to be like, okay, well, data analysts, I'm looking for someone with R, but like, you know, there could also be someone with Python could also be good or like someone who has experience with Tableau, but like also what are some other softwares that are like Tableau? Like they have their requirements and they're searching for that. So if you really want to work at a company and you know you have the experience to match what they're looking for, match your resume to the job description the best that you can. 
It requires a little bit of extra work on your part to go back and tailor each resume to each job, which is why I said, if you really want to work at the company, if it's a, you know, a, a really important role for you or it's something that you really want to do, um, take the extra 10 minutes and just make sure you're aligning your resume to the job description the best that you can. Thanks, Sarah. Anything else, Sarah? Any thoughts there? Anything you want to add about product or best practices in building a resume? No, I mean, I think that you covered pretty much everything. Um, I think I really want to hone in on um, just the simplicity of a resume. Um, I just did a, like a session on resume reviews with another university and, you know, some of the students that I spoke with, like there just were so many words and like so many sections and parts and this and that. And I'm like, just simplize, you know, it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, you know, I mean, I'm only speaking from ISIM's perspective as a recruiter, just because I've never worked anywhere else. But for us, we're really looking at, like Sarah mentioned, are you fit for the role, your location, your technical skill, um, the experience that you have, you know, we're not looking for a fancy resume. So um, I think just taking the time, as Sarah mentioned, to really match yourself to the role, especially if it's a role you're very passionate about, that's what we're going to be looking for. Um, we're not looking for anything fancy, you know, spend your time doing that as opposed to, you know, trying to figure out the best format. Mm -hmm. um, simplicity is great. <laughs> I will share a little recruiter inside tip. Uh, I don't read every single bullet under your experience. <laughs> so if you're sitting there stressing about the seventh bullet on your third project all the way down your resume, like what should I include? Should I include this? If I don't include it, are they going to move forward with me? we are skimming that, right? We don't get deep into that until the recruiter phone screen round. So when you're pulling your resume together and you're applying to a job, you want to get to that next step to be able to meet with the recruiter and talk to them about that experience. But again, five to eight seconds, we are absolutely not reading the entire resume top to bottom, cover to cover. Like it is really supposed to be a high level overview of your experience and what you've done. If I see software engineering internship at IBM, talked about IBM earlier. Okay, great. Like that's experience that I understand. I don't need to read every single bullet. I know that there's enough, like I know that conversation enough to know that like that's a match, right? But if, you know, you had, you know, a sales internship and you were applying to a software engineering internship, the bullets might help draw that conclusion. But I promise you and I guarantee you, Sarah feels the same way. We do mm -hmm. not have the time to read cover to cover, top to bottom on the resume. So you don't have to stress so much about those bullets. That conversation, that piece of it comes in much later. Awesome. Jamie asked another question. In those oh, three minutes, yeah, thank you, Jamie. Um, what typically catches your eye about an applicant that would make you want to move them to the next step? Um, and that then she, Go ahead, sorry, sorry. No, and then Jamie said, sorry, I'm asking so many questions. And I just <laughs> want to tell you, Jamie, thank you. No, this is- Please ask the question. <laughs> Um, I would say it's match and fit for the role. So um, again, I'll use my software engineering example. So, uh, you know, we require someone with a degree in computer science. It'd be great if you had an internship in software engineering in the past, um, you know, and we would love experience with Java. So perfect match to that would be, you know, you know, goes to college, studies computer science, had a software engineering internship last summer, um, listed a project that they did in Java, right? That, Boom, 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 right? I'm looking for like school, past experience, projects next. So it's kind of hard to get like one sweeping statement of like every single job, this is the perfect candidate. This is what encourages us to move forward. Um, but like I said, it really, that's where the matching comes into play and really makes a difference because we're looking, you know, we know the requirements of the job and we're looking to see if your resume meets that. So the best that you can match that is really the, the kind of key, I think, in being able to move forward with somebody. Um, doesn't mean that if you don't hit every single mark, we're not going to move forward. A lot of it has to do, and I guess this is also kind of inside our recruiter one-on-one. -on -one. When we say, sorry, we're not moving forward, we had a better match for the role, that's not just a line. That's correct. So I think a lot of times students will get hung up on, well, why wasn't I good enough? What didn't I have? What didn't I do? And it's truly not that you didn't have or you didn't do or you didn't articulate. It's that somebody else was just a better match for the job. And when you have 70,000 or 500 applicants for the role, sometimes there is just a better match. So, you know, we are definitely taking a lot into consideration, but we don't want students to feel like discouraged if they don't get it this time, or, you know, we decided not to move forward with them right off the bat because 
you may be like, no, I matched all of my experience and it was perfect. I know I was a perfect fit. Sometimes there is just, you know, a little bit of a better fit, but um, Sarah, what are your thoughts? Do you have anything to share on yeah. resume, you know, including tips? Yeah, I would totally agree with what you're saying, Sarah, um, in regards to some of the top things that you look for. Um, and me personally, I like to see some personality come through on a resume. So, you know, if some people put in like volunteer. Like your name in the shape of a sailboat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, like, you know, if they put in some volunteer work, some hobbies that they have on their resume, I love to see that because if someone says, you know, volunteered for beach cleanup or, you know, t hip hop class, like, anything random, like anything that you enjoy, to, enjoy doing outside of school or outside of work, I love to see that because I'm like, I want to hear a little bit more about that. And, you know, sometimes volunteer work can definitely transfer into the job, right, um, from a soft skills perspective. So um, that's something else that I definitely look at. Um, so I would, in, I would encourage that as a tip to, you know, if you're kind of trying to figure out, should I put this on here? Is it necessary? You know, I think it's a personal opinion for me. There may be other recruiters who don't necessarily care about that. They're more just looking at, are you fit for the role? Um, I, I like to do a little bit of both because I think, you know, when I think about our culture, uh, you know, Sarah talked about how we have an award-winning culture and, and uh, it's really about diversity, right? And inclusion in the workplace. And um, for me, that's one of my favorite parts about iSIMS is that we are diverse and we're working towards um, increasing that. And that means diversity on all levels, right? Um, and that's from a personality standpoint too. And what we all share is that we're all passionate, we're all driven. So um, I typically like to see that come out, right? When in a resume and, and then, you know, if we get to the phone screen st stage, um, seeing that come out on the phone screen as well. So that would be my tip for you is, you know, if you do have hobbies that are fun, um, interesting, you know, it could be a great talking point during the interview. Oh, I think Julia, you're muted. Sorry. In the same vein for Sarah and Sarah, things to stay away from and to avoid. Um, we in the career department say, please, you know, d stay away from political, religious, personal, hot topics, um, presuming an opinion that you're not sure your audience has. So I would just love your reinforcement of that or adding to it and anything else that you can, you know, say that you've seen and it's a common mistake, but it's a good thing to be aware of. Um, yeah, like the old like adages are still true. Like, please proofread it. Like have somebody else read it if you need to. Like, personally, I'm not going to necessarily like automatically decline you if I think you're the perfect fit because like grammatically or, or spelling is wrong, whatever it is. But like, if there are a few like red flags or a few no's, like it'll probably push me to say no. So just the attention to detail, like giving it a once over and be deliberate about it. Um, at this stage, like you really shouldn't have more than a page. Like, <laughs> Try to get it to a page. Again, I know that like as you grow in your career, that becomes um, very touch and go for each recruiter has their own opinion on if a resume should be a page or not. Um, I read something once, I think, I don't know if it was like Jeff Bezos or like a CEO of a major company, his resume is a page. Like if his resume is a page, all of our resumes can be a page kind of a thing. Um, but at this stage, definitely as a recent grad or as an intern, a page. Um, so proofread it, a page. Sure, yeah, I think it's probably safe to like never put anything like overly political or religious on your resume. That's probably like just a safe bet in general. Um, but be like thoughtful about it in a way, like don't just kind of like a slap experience on there, like format it, go through it, put bullets, like, you know, have it just be thoughtful. This is your brand um, and you want it to be representative of your brand. Um, and I'd say I, I personally, not that it's a no-no, but I personally think that an objective statement is a waste of space. Um, your resume is your objective statement. If I can't read your resume and already decide what you're doing or, and where you want to go and what your passion is and where you want to be, um, if I have to read a paragraph where you summarize that for me, your resume probably isn't telling the right story. Mm -hmm. There. Um. Yeah, I would agree with what you're saying. And then I think, uh, and just really, really want to stress the idea of proofreading and just being careful. Um, 
you know, sometimes I'll have resumes come through and like the edits are still on there. Like they submitted. Like, oh my God. Yes. I can't believe I forgot that. I, that drives me nuts. <laughs> yeah, you know, like they'll submit the version that still has the edits on there and it's like, just be careful. And you know, I hate to say it, but yeah, most times I'm like, no, it's going to be a no because this person that like, you know, obviously I don't know what happened. They could have been rushing. You know, I don't want to, I'm not here to judge, but if you're not careful, about submitting a resume for a job that you really want, right? You're, there is an opportunity here for you to work somewhere um, and you're not taking it seriously enough where you're paying attention to which version you're updating. Um, to me, it's, it's a red flag. So um, I would definitely hone in on that. Definitely just be careful with the grammatical errors and, and just pay attention to which um, resume that you are submitting. I think one time um, a candidate submitted a resume that wasn't even theirs, so. <laughs> <laughs> I've had candidates submit like spouses' resumes or like papers. Like uh, yeah. this was my like history final paper, and I'm like, well, that's lovely, but yeah, it only gives you so much. And make sure your email address and phone number are correct. Yes, I have had a number of candidates put the wrong phone number, wrong email address, and then we can't reach out to you. So that's an easy one too. Yep, would agree. Did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, any advice on how to answer the question? So what did you do during the COVID time when you yeah. had all this experience and all this time on your hand? Because I know that's, this is my favorite one to start asking and I'd love what you're hearing. Any suggestions, tips for our students? Yeah, I mean, hopefully the answer is easy because you know, they did take the time to kind of learn and grow. We talked about this early on, right? We had to, in full transparency, pull back our internship program for the summer. And Sarah and I had the really, um, you know, just genuinely awful job of having to call students and tell them that we're not able to move forward. It was the worst day in my seven year campus recruiting career. And it was probably not the way Sarah thought she'd be kicking off her first year in campus. But, um, you know, the message to the students was, we're all gonna be, recruiters are all gonna be incredibly understanding of you not having an internship over the summer. Like no one's going to blame you for not having that perfect experience or having it have been pulled back. We get it. But just like us at our year end reviews, you know, if we say, oh, you know, it was downtime, you know, we didn't really have much going on. So binge watch 12 shows on Netflix. It was great. Like that's not going to cut it for me. You know, Sarah and I did a lot of training and development and we were prepping and pipelining for we were back to it. Like it was like we never skipped a beat. We expect students to have done the same. And that might not come in the form of an internship, but it should have come in the form of training or volunteering or, um, you know, using the time and free resources on the internet to do a, you know, a class that they, you know, wouldn't have had a chance to take, like, you know, working any other job. Like, the answer doesn't matter so much as that there is an answer, right? There should, you should have been doing something during this time. And it literally could have been, um, oh, I read this great book because I was really interested in, you know, quantum physics and I never had time to read about it before and I decided that that was what I wanted to do with my time. Just showing us that there was a deliberate use of time um, it personally will be enough for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah and I would say you know we have a lot of empathy towards students you know um, we understand we went through as Sarah mentioned the terrible experience of having to pull back our internship so um, we saw firsthand how it impacted students and, and so we do feel for them and um, I would say to Sarah's point it's it's more so just being able to say this is what I did no, no matter what that looks like um, and frankly if you didn't do anything be transparent about why you know just be super honest with us um, and and we'll see that you know just be genuine and we'll see that shine through um, and again we're empathetic we understand that it's a really weird time this is Everyone is going through the same thing, right? And um, we're all trying to pivot and adjust. Um, so again, we understand. And I would just say, be honest, be genuine with res your response. Um, because if you don't, we'll see that. You know, we have a, we have a pretty good way of, um, how do I say this in a <laughs> PC way? You know what I mean? We just see, we can see right through you if you're just making stuff up, right? So just be honest. Any other questions out there? We have a few minutes for some more Q&A. We would love to hear from the students directly. I know that Jamie can't come off mute, but um, if anyone else would like to come off and ask any questions, we're, we're here for you for the next eight minutes. 
even if it's not directly related to applicant tracking software, or like our thoughts on the process, um, we're like, we're not subject matter experts in like the, the world post COVID, like nobody is, but um, you know, we have started recruiting again. So Sarah could be a really good litmus test as to like, you know, what have some of those experiences been that students have had or, you know, any just concerns that you guys have, we're like totally happy to share best yeah. practices or our advice. Don't be shy. Don't all jump at once. Anyone else? Career services team. <laughs> cool. Well, hopefully this was at the very least informative um, to give you guys kind of more of a just behind the scenes of like what the resume and application process looks like. Um, we say this all the time, right candidate, right place, right time. Um, you know, it's really about matching the right student with the right role at the right time for them based on experience. So we know it's going to be a long and, and daunting process, but um, it truly does like eventually all work out for the best. And if you guys have any questions or, you know, you're looking, you know, for advice as you kind of move through this like very weird fall semester, again, we are not the subject matter experts, but we're happy to just kind of continuously touch base on what we're seeing and what some of the best practices might become and um, just definitely stay in touch with students, all of you as you're applying to internships and jobs and career services team, all of you as you guys are helping to coach them throughout. Thank you so much, everyone. And students, um, we're so thrilled that ISIMS will be at our upcoming Career Connections Day on October 22nd. You'll all get invitations um, for positions to work at ISIMS in addition to this info session, um, which is being taped. So please feel free to share it with any students you know who couldn't um, make it today. And Sarah and Sarah, thank you. So much. Your puppy dog was quiet there. I was looking forward to seeing oh, his face. Yeah. I, I have no <laughs> idea what he's destroying, but it's something. I'll make sure to email you after we get off the call and let you know what. Okay. <laughs> Thank awesome. you so much, everyone. Thanks, guys. And quickly before the students leave, I put a survey in the chat um, in order to have this count towards your your badge um, of getting of watching five out of eight of the career academies. Please. Be sure to take the survey. The survey will also be available online. Um, it says it asks for a code. Let me double check. All right. Um, you'll have to take the survey for its account, and it will be under the recording of the video online. Um, I'm not getting a code. Alan, do you mind quickly testing that for me? And while they do that, guys, just to remind you to look at the chat, um, this is an amazing opportunity to connect with Sarah and Sarah on LinkedIn. They both invited you to do so. I'm giving you their correct spelling. Um, Liam, it does say enter a code. It requires that. All right, so I will email it to all the students who were available today once I get a version that doesn't have a code. Great, I took attendance, so I can send you their names if you want, Liam. Perfect, yeah. thank you. I have yep. four. Do you have four, Sam? I have four. Yep. And I have the names as well. Awesome. Okay, and thank you, Jamie and Frank. I think you're the only two that are still on. And Catherine. Um, I, I don't see her. Oh, Catherine, I see you too. Thank you guys so much for attending and please spread the word that students should view this. It's really important information. And thanks, thanks career guys. team. Great thank session. You. Thank you guys. Hello. Bye guys. Bye. Hello. Is there a code or something? Greg, I'll, I'll email it to you. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. All right. Have a nice day. You as well.